Great God and most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your goodness, for Your perfection, all that You are. All that you um, are is reflected in all that you have done and all that you continue to do by grace in your goodness. We thank you for um, the experience of your fatherhood. We pray, Lord, that we would indeed be sons and daughters in your household, that we would live as we are called, that we would Find our identity first in knowing yours, who you are, what you're like, and what we um, must do in response to that. We pray, Lord, that you would lead us to worship, even through the message this evening, that we we would praise you for all that you have shown to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, in your Bibles tonight, the Gospel according to John and the first chapter. John chapter 1, verse 35. And I'm just a moment, I'm going to read to verse 43. John 1, 35. And I'm going to read to 43. There's a couple of passages I'm going to take you to tonight to fill out the picture, but this is definitely where we're going to start. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you saying? And he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. This evening I want to ask the question, as we explore the subject of identity, who am I? Who are you? Who are we? If I were to ask you your name, or not your name, if I were simply to ask, who are you? That does sound a bit abrupt, a bit rude, but if I were to find a polite way of asking, and who are you? You would respond by telling, in all probability, your name. Sometimes I sit down with people and um, I know their name and I know uh, little bits about them, but not enough. And uh, I'm trying to get to know them. And so my my first um, question that I often ask, uh, whether it's someone who's looking into, um, uh, you know, perhaps uh, church membership or someone who's exploring baptism or someone who is um, uh, wondering if maybe maybe they... They understand the gospel, but they're not sure if yet they're trusting in it. And, and um, I, I'm having those conversations with them. Or perhaps they've applied to the Growing Leaders program or something like that. I'll, I'll, um, I'll ask the question, who are you? Tell me about yourself. And they'll start, even if I know their name, by saying, I am. And they'll say their name. And then they'll tell me stuff about themselves and um, unpack, uh, you know, sort of things about, as they perceive it, what makes them them. In other words, they are clarifying their identity. But always we start with introductions. We start with our name. Why? Because there is a lot in a name. 
Names not only have meanings, but uh, they, they do have meanings. Very important meanings. We don't even necessarily always know the meaning of our names. And from um, culture to culture, sometimes the significance of names' meanings and their heritage and their traditions within them have been lost, have, have slipped in some ways. But there are some who retain those. And some, never mind within culture, some families who retain those. For um, uh, myself, the meaning of names and the story behind names and the heritage they represent and the honor they show to others in the family is still very important to me. Um, Because names identify us. The names not only have meanings, they sometimes conjure emotions in those who hear them. Gladness or sadness, courage or fear, love or hatred, rejoicing or regret. Names can trigger and traumatize. They can remind you of who you are, of where you come from. Of some, na- some, some names, they even tell you something about why you are. Acting as both a divine testimony and a personal mission statement. It's therefore all the more advisable that when um, you, that, that you are introduced to someone that you call them by their given name. Or the name that they have introduced themselves with. Unless, for some reason, that would be inappropriate. There are, I believe, such scenarios. Can I call you blank instead? Is annoying to the person who has just introduced themselves by what they want to be called. It's even more annoying when you introduce yourself and they suddenly start calling you some shortened version of your name. Uh, you know, I, I thought I was immune to that. Uh, you know, Ryan is just, it's an easy name, isn't it? And um, uh, the thing is, there's this likable guy who wants to be one of the lads, a bit of a happy chappy, um, uh, my um, gas engineer, and he insufferably, um, you know, he calls up, you all right, Rye? I didn't answer, I've never gone by Rye. No one has ever called me Rye. Yeah, you're a legend, Rye. Can you, can you pay that invoice real quick now? You know, and literally, that's exactly how, how he communicates with me. I've never indicated Rye is a shortened version of my name, that it's at all acceptable or something. Um, but uh, my friend, if you are turning into the YouTube or uh, whatever, I actually have accepted it from you. It is okay. <laughs> Intentionally getting a name wrong or acting like the name is more difficult than it really is or saying, as has happened to Uliana, a simple enough name, which he makes easier for people by explaining how to say it. A dismissive, ah, I'm not going to call you that anyway. After the person has made a big show of belaboring, very cringe. And of course, you remember things like that years later. Not sure if you should. It's not healthy to hold grudges, certainly, but why? Because names are important. And to mangle someone's name, especially intentionally, even sometimes just accidentally, I confess to having been guilty of that, can be offensive. Why? Because names have meaning. They convey something of our identity. And and, and so, um, uh, I, I, I introduce myself by my full name. Normally, I just use in personal conversation my first and uh, my, I say, Hi, I'm Ryan. In formal settings, I say, I'm Ryan King if I'm being filmed or something. In writing, I've always gone by my three names. And so there are some people who don't know me too great on a face to face basis, so when they write my name, they write all three names. And I'm cool with that because that's how I publish things in my name. It means something. Don't mess about with people's names. Now, what about what, 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 if, what if someone gives you, though, a strong nickname? You know, what if, what, 
I don't, I'm not going to play around with assigning you nicknames because that could veer into offensive territory potentially. But what if, so, what if you've done something or you've said something and someone just says, yeah, I'm going to call you this. Or they, but you like it. It's not demeaning. It's not defamatory. It's not offensive in any way. It's not belittling or disregarding or anything like that. But it's a strong, kind of cool nickname. My grandfather called me Rhino. R-H-I-N-O. And um, I, I don't think anyone has ever called me Rhino but him. Um, and he died when I was 11 years old. But I can still hear his voice calling me that name. It's actually one of the few things that I can hear and remember his voice. If someone calls you something that robs you of, not that robs you of your identity, but rather affirms your identity and underlines your identity, you're likely to claim it. And I liked, I liked that nickname. I liked rhinoceroses, but now the more I think about it, you have these ashen, lumbering, fat, lazy creatures sort of lumbering about um, madly. I'm not entirely sure how flattering it is. But I prefer to see the, the strong side of the creature. It's never been any different. And so when Jesus is introduced to Simon Peter, bear in mind, he's actually not introduced to Simon Peter, he's introduced to Simon. And in being introduced to Simon, Jesus says, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. And John gives us the explanation, which means Peter. And because we do not speak Aramaic, Cephas, and we do not speak Greek, Peter, or Petros. He's saying effectively in our language, you shall be called rock. You have a footnote in your Bible potentially next to Peter. Cephas is the Aramaic. Peter is English for Petros, which means rock. So, so Jesus is saying to this man, you are Simon, son of John, affirming who he is, but you shall be called, and he calls him by another name. And that has meaning and power, because there's a lot in a name. Think, think about uh, Peter before Christ, and, and we, we see that really in those words, you are. Just stop there. You are. If we're exploring the idea of uh, the, the whole concept of identity, we must start with those two words, you are. And those are great words. They're beautiful words. You are communicates existence. It communicates life. And by communicating life, it communicates something of your dignified humanity. You are. And to say you are is to say many things, but within those two words, for the Christian are encapsulated the truth that you are because God is. And that God has created you. And that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And that you are made in the image of God with intrinsic dignity, value, and worth. Is there not power in those words? Is there not meaning and significance and rich substance in just those words, you are? You've heard of the saying, I think, therefore I am. You could reverse that. You are, therefore you think. You have a conscience. You have a, some sort of internal system that is working however, however debilitated or disabled you become. Something that is ticking in there that is alive, that God made, that reflects His glory. You are a man, you are a woman made in the image of God. When, when Jesus looks at this person coming to Him and says, you are, 
he is communicating a truth about Simon's dignified humanity. And within that, there are other things that we could attach to his humanity. They do not make him human, but they are um, subcategories within his humanity. And they're important. They are a part of what makes Simon, Simon. So he says, you are what? Simon, son of John. That is, you have a family. You have an ancestry. You have a heritage. Your name, Simon, Shimon. It is a Hebrew name. It is a Jewish name. The name is indicative of his ethnicity. And in a globalized world, less and less um, do we have um, uh, always names that are necessarily indicative of one's um, ethnicity. But nonetheless, there are stories that are told by our names. Certainly, one's told by Simon's. And even if our names do not communicate that. Other factors in our life. Family, surname, upbringing, culture, skin color, nationality, citizenship, other forms of identity. They communicate something about the ethnicity that we have in the providence of God. In Simon's case, what is that? Well, he's a Jew. He's, he's a Hebrew. Remember that to be a Jew is not simply to subscribe to Jewish faith. Um, uh, it is as much a, a, an ethnicity as it is um, a religious belief system. And so um, uh, Simon is a Jew. The, his name indicates um, Jewish heritage. His family indicates Jewish heritage. His context, and as we read around this, this man is clearly of that background. Furthermore, we learn elsewhere that he was, what he was occupationally. I guess the question is, um, you know, how linked we are in our identity to our occupation. But, as much as we might quibble, when someone asks you who you are, what's the most likely follow-up question? What do you do? And why do they ask what you do? Sometimes it's innocent. Sometimes it is out of genuine curiosity and I want to get to know you as a person. But let's just be honest, in um, uh, even 21st century London and a classist society, what do you do has often uh, been pregnant with other baggage, um, trying to, to slot you in. Who, what sort of person are you? And... Uh, you can generally discern what a person's motives are by how they respond when you answer. Do they continue having a conversation with you pleasantly and normally? Do they ask you normal questions? Or do they say, oh. And then at the earliest possible opportunity, um, if they've not already sort of faded away listening to you monologue a bit, uh, they, they find someone else to chat to. It's unfortunate, is it not? Because although we, we are in a situation of dignified humanity, there's more to it than that, isn't there? Hold that thought. Simon was a fisherman. He's called a fisherman. Throughout the, the um, uh, various accounts of Jesus' early interactions with him, he is very clearly defined in some way, by what he does. So he's Simon, the fisherman. And he's there in the boat, casting nets. Or he's there by the sea, mending nets. But he is in some way connected to his work. And again, that varies depending on the context and the culture and the situation. Some people are more or less connected in their identity to what they do. But for Simon, this was more than a job. This was a way of life. It was a part of his identity. Go to Luke. Can we turn to Luke? Luke chapter 5. 
So what we just read is Jesus meeting Simon for the first time. But that is not when Jesus called Simon to follow Him. There are at least two interactions that He has at separate moments with this man. And this second one takes us from from Simon uh, in dignified humanity to Simon in depraved humanity. Luke chapter 5, verse 1 through 10. I'll just read it. Um, uh, It'll be better than my storytelling. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish. Their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Like I said, something's gone wrong. Our dignified humanity is not just that. It's, it's become by sin, depraved humanity. Uh, Simon knows he's a man, and therefore he does have, as we've established, intrinsic dignity, value, and worth as one made in the image of God. But he is fallible and flawed. Throughout the Gospel accounts, well after this point, We come across a man who is described sometimes by Jesus Himself as dull-headed, as doubtful. He's even called Satan at one point. Not the perfect man. Not man as He was created to be. But let me be very clear because sometimes this, this gets mangled in our cultural moment. It is not that He is a man that makes him sinful. Do we understand that? As in, it is not that he is, let's reword that perhaps a bit, it is not that he is a male that makes him sinful. His biological composition is his by God. God made them what? Male and female. Um, In that, He is is as He was created to be. His biological composition is His by God. His spiritual disposition is His by His deceived ancestor, Adam. He is a sinner by nature. And so He sins according to that nature. And thus He is sinful. And thus He must fall at the feet of Jesus and say, Forgive me. I am a sinful man. Sometimes people don't understand that one, one being, um, you know, a man is not what makes them sinful. But by being men, we are inevitably sinful. Let me just explain because certainly uh, there are narratives that are going through society that can demonize men almost uniformly in a way that they actually are put off being or aspiring to be what God has made them and called them to be. Does that make sense? Various narratives that actually emasculate men. Various attitudes that that hinder the progress of men. And it's important that we as a church of all um, uh, people be very clear on this. Because God made them male and female. I just remember that time I've told you about when 
uh, I, I, the lady was being assaulted around the corner um, by her um, ex-boyfriend. And I, um, I, I ran up to the, uh, the scene, and there were other guys just sort of milling about, sort of looked down, and they, but then they retreated to the cafe. It was, okay, fair enough. Um, they're, it's just me charging at this guy, yelling at him ferociously to back off, and um, off he goes. Get the woman, get her in a car. It didn't seem to alarm this other woman's husband that I was in the car with his wife and this other woman. Um, he kind of looks in, everything okay? Great, back to the lads in the cafe. <laughs> so there I am speaking on the phone with the, the police, trying to console this woman and all of that. And the other woman in the car is trying to console the woman. And she's like, she's like, who was that? Was it your ex? And the woman sobbing, yes, it was my ex. Did he cheat on you? <laughs> Just <laughs> no context. Yes, yes, he cheated on me. Men, they're all the same. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and they're... they're, they're I'm, I'm a man outnumbered in the backseat of this car, actually, trying to help this woman. And, um, and, and there's this bonding session over sort of Miss Andre that's happening in the car. All sorts of horrible comments being said about, about men just because they're men. And at the end of the day, I was like, you know what? It's born out of their personal experience, and I know who I am in God, and I know who I am in Christ. But um, so I'm not going to take it personally. But it's kind of it is kind of funny, isn't it? That people have those attitudes. Men, and I speak to those who are biologically male. When I say men, um, you are men by creation, and you're sinners by Adam. You can know and enjoy redeemed maleness by, like Peter, humbling yourself before Jesus and saying, forgive me for I'm a sinner. I'm a sinful man. Because we all are sinful men. And the same could be true of women because, uh, truth be told, the dominating um, uh, narrative of history has often been one that has belittled and harmed and um, um, demeaned women. Sisters, not treating them as the scriptures tell us as sisters, not giving them the honor um, and the respect and the protection that we as actually men are called to um, provide. Okay, so, so um, we've, it's not that you're male, it's not that you're female, because men, I, I, I do sometimes hear guys, like, uh, I, literally, I, I, I saw someone talking recently about um, they, they replay in their imagination the events of the Garden of Eden. And Eve reaching for the, 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 the fruit. And it's like, I'm always like, Eve, no! How could you? Uh, I'm like, wow, that's what Adam said to God. The woman that you gave me did this. But the reality is, we are all sinners. We have all rebelled against God. We have all fallen short. It is not that you're male or female that makes you a sinner. It is that you have sinned against God that makes you a sinner. Similarly, it is not Simon's Jewishness that makes him a sinful man. And again, we're speaking not in, in, in terms of belief system at this point. We are speaking in terms of his ethnic identity. Um, uh, ours, ours, we must be very clear, is not a message of anti-Semitic bigotry. Far too common in our world today. Especially, I must say, at a populist European and American level. And it is bizarre how, how similar both the far left and the far right are on these issues today. Wherever you look, the Jews are the bad guy. And I have heard, God forgive us, but in this room sometimes, individuals who have made anti-Semitic comments or things about Jews. Okay, we just have to call that out for the evil that it is. The Gospel is the power of God to salvation for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. We serve a Savior of the world who is the Jewish Messiah. 
We must, we must be clear on that. It's important. Our televisions have broadcast angry young men. It's not, this is not something old people who are past it. Angry young men screaming, Jews will not replace us. There are dehumanizing theories about evil Jews and secret dominion over the world that are far too common, more so than some realize, even in churches. No, it is not that Simon is a Jew, but rather that he is a sinner, one of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We could say the same regardless of where he were on genetic constructs of ethnicity or social constructs of race. It is not his Jewishness that makes him a sinful man. Do we understand that? You know, um, uh, Johnny was telling me earlier about this, um, this fellow he met on Wood Green High Road this afternoon and was talking about the gospel with him. And the man said he was a Moor. Um, he belongs to um, a, the Amer- I think it's the American Scientific Church of Moors or something like that. In any case, this is a group that subscribes to the Quran. Okay? But they're not Muslims, they're Moors. They'll tell you that. They sell um, incense and um, perfumes uh, on the oils, oils on the high road. Their organization, and many like them, formed in the vacuum of dehumanization in America. It is an American organization. He's from New Jersey. Cult groups that proclaim a false gospel developed off the back of slavery and segregation of black people in America. And these people say, we're Moabites. That's their background. We're Moabites. We are descended from the tribe of Moab. And they give their people an identity, a purpose, a textbook, a scripture, and a narrative that they can embrace and have for their own in the absence of heritage and history that was robbed from them. It's very sad, it's very heartbreaking, and yet it is idolatry. It's wrong. Flip side of that is the Hebrew Israelites. Some of the men engaged with Hebrew Israelites on the high road last week. It's interesting, you have some people who want to be Moabites, and you have some people who want to be Hebrews. Um, and they were always at odds. And it's interesting, the, the Moabites are like, the, the, both of these developed from the states, so we can only apologize, um, uh, those of us from there. But um, the, the Moabites are like, the black people of America are Moabites. And the other groups like the black people of America are Hebrews. And both are attempting uh, uh, to create a narrative. And they broadened out to be more accepting of particularly black people across other parts of the world except the continent of Africa. Um, so so it, it's a fascinating sort of thing. Why does that happen? Because people have robbed people of their identity. They've not affirmed dignified humanity. They've majored on depraved humanity. But in fact, they've not even majored on depraved humanity. They've just majored on depraved. They've taken away the humanity. And in the vacuum of identity that's created, false teaching has crept in. Not just crept in, swept in at times. That's why it's very important that we do not um, um, uh, diminish the beauty and glory of one's ethnic background in God's creative design, in His sovereign purposes. But we keep going. It was not Simon's fisherman occupation that made him a sinful man. Well, why would that be? Well, you know, in, in the same way, we ought not to be man-hating misandrists or Jew-hating racists. We ought not to be fishermen-hating classists. You say, well, that's not what classism is about, really. And yet, it's not, is, is that not in some way belittling and dehumanizing to look down on a brother or sister made in the image of God 
because of their occupation, because it doesn't pass muster with us on the scale of respectability in society. Obviously, I'm not talking about things that are objectively sinful. But there are are people even in the New Testament who looked down on Simon because he was an uneducated fisherman. He was an uneducated simpleton with limited options and life skills. He had chosen to work hard instead of smart. Being poor, having a hard working man's job, not being as educated or literate as some doesn't make someone sinful. No, it doesn't even make someone stupid. Those are prejudice narratives. Being a sinner makes someone sinful. And it has a noetic effect. It, it, it works on our reason processes and our mind. And being sinful is what ultimately makes us stupid. Sinners express their sinfulness in specific ways. Some, we've talked about this before, their self-righteousness, their self-loathing, their selfishness. Sin becomes a part of identity. Sin becomes definitional. Fools, we read about fools in the, in the Bible. What is that? That's definitional. Someone is described as a fool. The foolish. Definitional. The unrighteous. Definitional. The wicked. And so forth. These are definitional terms. I, terms of identity, are they not? Sometimes specific sins are highlighted as definitional of identity. So if you were to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, we read in that verse, Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, or actually the broader translation of that is um, uh, people who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So, what are those terms exactly? He doesn't say someone who has committed sexual immorality, does he? He says, the sexually immoral. He doesn't say someone who swindled their neighbor. He says, swindler. He doesn't say the guy who stole something sometimes. He says, thieves. People who want, but they never have enough. Um, no, he says, the greedy. Those are terms of identity. In other words, sin has become so part and parcel of who we are in our rebellion against God that we are... Sinners by name. We are sinners by nature. We are sinners in our identity. We, we, we still maintain that, that dignified humanity, but it has become so clouded by depraved humanity. Our world wants to talk all about dignified humanity. It wants us to affirm identity, sometimes even identity categories that do not exist in God's creative purposes or design. But the Bible tells us also about depraved humanity. We are not infallible. Our wishes are not necessarily pure. Our, um, our feelings, our orientations, our attractions, our desires, our impulses, our attitudes, our actions, that they are not stainless. On the flip side, there are some who, as I said earlier, are so focused on the depraved humanity that they forget the dignified humanity and therefore you cannot see any hope or help. Only a harsh word of condemnation. And that's what we don't want to do tonight. How, when Peter fell at the feet of Jesus and said, Forgive me, for I'm a sinful man. Did Jesus respond? Did Jesus depart? Sinner! Runs off. Doesn't want anything to do with him. You know, Peter falls at his feet. You know, get away from me, you, you know, filthy fisherman Jewish man. No. What does he do? He delivers him. 
Luke tells us how Jesus responds. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. Matthew summarizes the episode and includes a further command um, um, in, in Matthew's account. He says, follow me. And the truth is, any one of us who falls at the feet of Jesus and says, forgive me, I am a sinful man. Forgive me, I am a sinful woman. Will know the voice of Jesus saying, do not be afraid. Follow me. Does that not fill you with hope? Jesus restores dignified humanity. He, he brings us into a state of delivered humanity. Peter is still a man. Simon, sorry. Still a man. Still a sinner. But remade in the image and likeness of God. We see this even with reference to his ethnicity. He's still Jewish. But he's reconciled not only to God in Christ, but also to Gentiles in faith. We see this occupationally. Sometimes he's a fisherman. It was always something he could go back to. You, I mean, it's one of those skills. You, you have it. Once you have it, you know, you're pretty set for life. Um, for a brief while, he went back. After the crucifixion of Jesus, do you remember? He'd even seen the risen Jesus. But he was done. He goes back to the lake and he's fishing. But here's one thing he would always be. He would always be a fisher of men. Because Jesus had remade him. Don't be discouraged if you feel you are making slower progress than you would like. From conception, you are human. And always will be. But you've not stayed at the point of conception, have you? You grow and you develop. You live and you learn. Thus with the Christian, you are transformed into a new humanity that keeps the best bits that make you, you, intact, but changes your relationship with God in Christ immediately and then develops that new humanity and new identity progressively. The first time Jesus told Simon not to be afraid wasn't the last. Go over to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before Him to the other side while He dismissed the crowds. After He dismissed the crowds, He went up onto the mountain by Himself to pray. When evening came, He was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, He came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were terrified. And they said, It's a ghost! They cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, and remember, them include Simon, saying what? Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered, Lord, if it is You, command me to come to You on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and cried out, Lord, save... Um, uh, it came to Jesus. Um, when, when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out His hand and took hold of Him saying, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Those in the boat worshipped Him and said, Truly, you're the Son of God. We keep coming back to Peter's confession. We saw it last week. We come back to it this time. Truly, you are the Son of God. And this is where I want to persuade you that you cannot have a helpful understanding of identity if you just stay there at I am. You know, I am this, or I am that, or I am this person. I am, so far as you are, is concerned, will leave you disappointed. I am Ryan. 
will leave you disappointed. It will leave me disappointed in myself. You, Jesus, are. That's different. It's something else entirely. When Peter thought about who he was in himself, that's when he started to sink, isn't it? Because it says, Jesus said, come to me. Peter stepped out and started walking on the water. But when he saw the wind and the waves, don't think that it was the wind and the waves that put him off because he saw the wind and the waves before. Remember, the boat was about to capsize. He knew all about the wind and the waves. It's when he realized who he was in the face of the wind and the waves that he began to sink. Because I am... Even Peter, even rock, isn't very assuring when it's on water. <laughs> he starts to sink like a rock. And that's what happens when faith in ourself supersedes our faith in Christ. Faith in yourself will only get you so far. It is filled ultimately with doubt. When we take our eyes off of Jesus Christ and we begin to contemplate me and who I am and my identity apart from my identity in Christ and all that He is, then the wind and the waves will scare us and we will begin to sink. But if you trust in the Lord... So it's not really who am I in identity so much as who we are in community that we should be asking. Am I united to, in fellowship with, communing with, sharing in Christ and the triune God that He reveals? Is that worked out in communal relationship with God's people as we're knit together like many members in one body with Jesus Christ as the head? Finding identity not in who I am, but in who we are. Me with others in relationship to God and perhaps how we are in standing with God. That is paradigm shifting. When we see who Jesus is, it changes everything. When, when Peter, yes, even the one that God had said, you are Peter, you are rock, you are the one who will confess that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, and on this rock I will build my church. When Peter thought of himself and his identity purely as a man, he doubted the Gospel. Yeah. As a man, he doubted the Gospel proclamation of the women who came to him and said, Jesus is not in the tomb. He is risen. Don't think there wasn't something... <laughs> Something going on there when the ladies came to him and said, Jesus isn't in the tomb. He's risen. Silly women. They just didn't look hard enough. Off he runs and he's befuddled. He doesn't have a clue what's going on. They, they believe he's risen. Uh, not really sure what's happening. When, when Peter thought of himself and his identity, not just as a man, but as a Jewish man, more specifically, before all of that, he cynically joined the disciples who questioned Jesus talking with a Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. And he told Jesus to send away a Canaanite woman in Matthew chapter 15. But when he remembered who Jesus is, you are the Son of God, he became one of the greatest messengers of that message in the history of the world. When he thought of himself as a Jew foremost, that posed a problem when it came to relating to non-Jews, Gentiles. Even in, even in the vision scape, while hungry, with God Himself offering Peter food delicacies in the vision, foods that were enjoyed only by Gentiles, Peter refused to eat, calling it common and unclean. But he later confessed that his problem extended beyond food to people. So when he meets a Gentile who wants to know the Gospel, he has to confess in Acts chapter 10, verse 28, you know how it is unlawful for me to associate or even visit you. Anyone from another nation, in fact. Unfortunately, he, he still struggled with, with this at times. Paul tells a story about Peter enjoying company of Gentile believers 
over food. But when some ultra-Jewish dudes rock up to the feast, um, uh, Peter gets weird and distances himself from the Gentiles. Paul says, I stood and denounced him to his face in front of everyone because he was out of set with the Gospel. So when, but when Peter remembered and considered who Jesus is and who he is with reference to Jesus, you are the Son of God, he would be able to transcend the biases and barriers of his ethnic identity and say, but God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. When, when Peter first thought of himself as a fisherman, he fell back on that. He left Jerusalem after seeing the risen Christ. And he started fishing again. And then one morning, he looks over from his boat and he sees Jesus on the beach cooking breakfast. And he dove into the water and, and, and ran through the water. Not because when the Son of God is cooking breakfast, you know it's going to be good. That might have been a factor. I've always wondered about that meal, actually. It must have been pretty nice. Um, misgivings about fish for breakfast aside. But Peter went because he was... His Savior was there. And there was, even when he fell back on that other identity, there was something calling him home to Jesus. He was fed by Jesus there on the beach. And he was told to feed Jesus His lambs, His sheep, His people. He was then basically told, you're going to be an old man one day and your hands are going to be stretched out and you're going to be taken where you don't want to go. Basically, you're going to be crucified. Because the way of the Savior is the way of the cross. But it comes out on the other side in resurrection, victory, and triumph. So we hear the words Jesus spoke next with help now and hope for eternity, there on the beach to Peter after telling him, you'll go where you don't want to go? What did Jesus say in John chapter 21, verse 19? Because we're not alone in our identity, but we're together in divine and church community, Jesus says it all over again, follow me. That's our identity. Whatever else we are, whoever else we are, we are nothing if we are not followers of Jesus Christ. Let's follow Him.